to one walking through the bustling market after a fruitful day of begging, Pio, a 14-year-old orphan, carried a content smile on his face. His bowl was filled with more food than he had hoped for, a sign that his luck was finally turning around. With determination in his eyes, he moved forward, envisioning a chance at a normal life ahead. As Pio journeyed toward his next nighttime location, his thoughts lingered on his past. But fate had something unexpected in store for him. A stranger with an enigmatic presence crossed his path, causing Pio's world to suddenly lose its vibrant colours. In the blink of an eye, he found himself in a dark and desolate place, all alone. Struggling to rise, he realised his strength was no match for the overwhelming despair that washed over him, tears and shivers consuming his fragile frame. Amidst his fear and confusion, Pio's memories came rushing back. Did the stranger have a connection to this grim situation? Pio pondered, uncertain of his captor's motives. Despite his own innocence and lack of animosity toward the stranger, Pio was trapped in this mysterious darkness, unable to fathom why. Drowning in a sea of emotions, Pio's grasp on reality slipped further away. In the suffocating darkness, time lost all meaning. He wept, the weight of his loneliness and terror bearing down on him. Hunger gnawed at his stomach while the fear of losing his sanity became a tangible presence. Pio's worries seemed to merge, overwhelming him in a torrent of uncertainty. Gradually, a shift occurred within Pio. The raw fury he felt began to give way to acceptance. He questioned less why he was facing this torment and focused more on his will to endure it. Weak, his eyes swollen from tears and lips bloody from biting them, Pio sensed a change, an easing of his breath, a slight reawakening of sensation, a glimmer of hope. His strength slowly returned, and with it, a newfound clarity. As Pio's senses reawakened, he pieced together his surroundings. The echoes of dripping water indicated a possible source of sustenance. In this life-or-death moment, Pio rallied his energy. Crawling inch by inch, he advanced, each movement a testament to his determination. His fingers grazed the rough surface of a wall, and he paused, carefully analysing his prison. In a moment of desperation, Pio inserted his finger into a small crevice, hoping for a sign, a way out. Pain shot through his finger as he withdrew it, his instinctive reaction bringing the wounded digit to his lips. Collapsing onto the ground once more, Pio's hope wavered. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. What is the most important skill of an assassin? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now back to the recap. Exhausted after trying so hard, Pio Wool found himself lying on the ground. Someone who looked very much like him walked over. With a quick glance, Pio realised he was looking at his own reflection. A strange image appeared, resembling him. It asked Pio why he was struggling so much to survive in this situation. Pio could only stare in surprise, feeling the mockery in its gaze. The figment laughed at his efforts, making everything Pio did seem pointless. It tried to trick Pio into giving up, but Pio had other plans. He wanted to survive, no matter how tough things got. Even though the figment was trying to scare him, Pio was determined not to give in. Revenge fueled his will to live. Waking up from sleep, Pio wondered if the encounter was a dream or a sign of his growing madness, but he was determined. He got up again, his determination giving him strength. Walking over to the wall, he studied it closely once more. He spotted moss growing on the wall. Hunger made him decide to eat it, using anything he could to survive. Pio's resolve pushed him forward. Done with the moss, he used the wall for support as he got up. He began exploring the area, trying to figure things out. His calculations suggested he was in a space about three by three jangs in size. Someone had trapped him here. That much was clear. Suddenly he heard a sound, an iron door. It creaked open slightly, allowing some light in. Pio's heart raced as he saw a hand and a shadow. The hand left food in the room. Pio's keen sense of smell told him there were different types of food. That meant more than one person was involved in his capture, perhaps more than five. Pio Wool, a captive in a dark place, figures out that he might not be alone in this misery. Others also seem to suffer like him. Hungry, he doesn't hesitate and digs into the food before him. As his hunger is satisfied, his face gains a renewed energy. He's been confined here, working on his body for the past four months, creating a routine around the daily food that arrives silently. In time, the darkness becomes more familiar, allowing him to spot even the crawling insects. Amidst his triumph, a snake slithers out of the shadows and wraps around his arm. Pio Wool, puzzled and frightened, is bitten within seconds. Agony courses through him and he clings to his arm, panic and fear painted across his face. The pain is unbearable, the area turns red and veiny, yet it doesn't ebb. A small door opens, offering his daily meal. He seizes it, distressed but determined to endure. He finishes eating, lying on the ground, the snake lurking nearby. 
Gradually his face regains a semblance of calmness as he gazes at the snake whose venom nearly killed him. After the detoxifying process, his vision improves. Stories of people gaining strength from snake bites cross his mind, leading him to a daring decision. He lets the snake bite him once more. His veins pop out, his body ignites with a different fire, less painful than before. As the pain subsides, his eye colour changes. With enhanced vision, he sees the door vibrate and open for the first time. P.O. Wool steps out, entering the next room. A foul odour hits him as he opens the door, revealing a corpse as old as himself. He moves forward. After a while, he sees an iron door blocking the hallway, its bolts taken out. P.O. Wool forces it open and finds two people inside, a girl and a boy. P.O. Wool walks into the new room and sees them. He checks a room on his left, only to find a corpse. The girl, so Yo Wool, asks P.O. Wool who he is and where he comes from. She explains that she and the boy are the only survivors. P.O. Wool realises she's not used to the darkness like him. He introduces himself and says he's trapped just like them. The girl, so Yowal, mentions more places like this in the dark. They introduce themselves. The boy, Song, and Pio Wool move on, with Pio Wool suggesting they follow him. So Yowal holds his hand for guidance. They reach another iron door, this time finding a bigger group of people. Pio Wool looks around and realises these people died differently, more from suicide than starvation. He notices more bowls and food compared to his area. So Yowal tells Pio Wool that everyone on this side was trapped about four months ago too, Pio Wool leads the group, and they find another iron door, but this time, it leads to light. The group enters a village-like area with torches. They notice the structures were erected hastily. A white-haired, blue-eyed girl named Lee Min introduces herself and says she's under Pio Wool's care. He wonders if snake bites caused his red eyes. Lee Min questions him, and Pio Wool thinks about the snake bites. So Yo Wool interrupts and talks about sticking together as a group. Pio Wool and Lee Min express their thoughts. Pio Wool decides to see how things go, and Lee Min also joins the group. They all walk into the darkness, forming factions and groups. People are divided into four factions, while Pio Wool remains alone. Rumours about Pio Wool spread, but he doesn't pay attention. He examines the walls and notices the underground space was built long ago, suggesting immense wealth. A hole in the ceiling opens and a basket of food descends. The group rejoices and feasts on the food, rushing to get their fair share. The challenge had begun. The teams were tasked to divide the food equally, with their leaders working together. Pio Wool was determined to take his share, but was stopped by Yom. Pio Wool was furious and attacked Yom, causing a tense standoff. The others intervened, telling Pio Wool to let Yom be. Despite this, Pio Wool continued to hurt Yom, causing Yo Wool to step in and calm things down. As everyone ate, Pio Wool realised that the test was meant to weed out the strongest children. Yobleton approached Pio Wool, warning him of the consequences his actions could bring. The survival of their groups was at stake. Although Pio Wool resisted, Yo Wool tried to convince him to join her faction. The situation escalated as members were found dead. Suspicion and paranoia grew, leading to more deaths. Pio Wool worked alone, knowing that the peace wouldn't last. One day, a group approached, seeking revenge against Pio Wool. Yom was with them, hungry for revenge. A snake attacked their adversaries, giving Pio Wool an opportunity to fight back. Yom tried to manipulate him, but Pio Wool saw through the lies. In a final confrontation, Pio Wool overpowered Yom, defeating him. Pio Wool stood before Yom's lifeless body, explaining that he did it because he was still weak. Yom's group was wiped out, and the other leaders found their bodies. The blame immediately goes to Pio Wool for their murder in the dungeon. People start thinking about Pio and his brilliant brains and brawn, and how cunning he's all around. His circumstances here are dire, Eventually, people need to be killed to save the already decreasing ration to ensure proper survival. Along with that, there is tension amongst the people as they are avoiding P.O. Wool too. In this family-like condition, news reaches the Go Youngs in faction that the Soyo faction has banished two kids from the Northern Red House and holds a necessary food item, a meagre potato. And since food is scarce, everyone charges in on the kids as their aura changes to that of bloodthirsty barbarians. Yongsan only looks in shock. The two kids were Yong Sin and his men. Into a narrow pathway with a girl whistling to give some kind of cue, the very next moment people from that faction jump out and attack the Young Sin faction. They have been trapped. Yong Sin shouts that they have been trapped, but it is all too late. Suddenly even Yong San himself is surrounded by these people with wooden bars. Then Sir Yo Will and Song show themselves while being optimistic that they can eradicate this entire group. Yong San looks at the two with utter rage in his eyes. He glares at them for a short while and then calms down, subsequently asking her if she will be satisfied after taking the wives of everyone, 
to which she replies that if Yongsin takes her stead, he might as well do the same. With that, she gives her final order to kill everyone. Yongsan desperately tries to fight for his life as the rage in his eyes is prominent, but he is killed. Pyo Wool is atop a building, analysing everything. He deduces that the current incident is into battle using terrains where one must use the buildings for strategic advantage over the other. He further extrapolates that the people who made this want the people to become customary to killing others and that the huge house might belong to a large clan. That is why barging in recklessly is not an option. The reason everyone is here is that they are tools to be raised as assassins. Members of the Soyo faction are gladly discussing the people they killed and how their leader is the best regarding their survival. Lee Min is sitting next to that rejoicing group and silently condemns their action. How can one so nonchalantly kill another person? She cries in shock and disgust. As per routine, the ceiling opens and food is given to the remaining survivors. The Suryo faction is in high spirits as no group remains to stop them. Pyo Wool is standing near So Yellow, but with a concerned expression, and his distraught is valid as food is not given this time. But a group of hooded masked men jumps down to kill everyone here. They swing their weapons at every person they see, ensuring no one survives. Pio Wool knows something's going to happen, but he didn't expect it so soon. He usually stays quiet during fights. After a bit, more men appear, wearing robes and masks with numbers. Pio Wool says these masked men take orders from the numbered ones. The first guy, the first sword, talks tough. He's the boss now, no exceptions. Interrupting him means death. The first sword talks privately with someone. The first sword says if you put poison bugs together, they'll fight till one's left with the deadliest poison. He talks about tough kids surviving and being wicked. Yellow leads a big group. They need to weaken her. Chin Wu and Kang Ayel are martial arts pros. They talk about P.O. Wool from a bad area, so he's different. The first sword wonders why the boss took this job. They can't leave any trace when they attack the blood shadow groove. The third guy tells the kids to finish a mission. The third sword gives the kids an objective. The one who reaches the final house first will get a two hour break, while the last one to arrive will be put through torture. This harsh training goes on for days, turning them into assassins. Those who can't handle it will surely die. Yo Wool stands out as a prodigy here, super talented. But then there's Pio Wool, considered just okay. Men keep an eye on him too. Pio Wool is reading the thunder splitting cultivate invasion technique. Yao Wool doesn't bother him, having already learned enough. Yao Wool goes to sleep, but Pio Wool meditates. He remembers each step, gathers energy, and feels the Kai. Others learn it differently but P.O. Wool has his own goal. He wants faster, clearer thoughts. He doesn't want to stand out too much or be too plain. Even during training, he hides his true skill. But today, his opponent means business. The other kid sees through P.O.'s act. The instructor doesn't notice, though. The opponent attacks hard, telling P.O. Wool to do the same. Around P.O. Wool, the opponent moves, throwing blades. But nothing works. P.O. blocks everything. P.O. Wool's patience is thinning. He throws his knife aside and kicks the opponent. The opponent coughs up blood and falls. The opponent tries again, but Pio breaks his arm. Everyone's surprised. The kids might be assassins in five years, not seven, but they know the target isn't ordinary. He's Seacon's most talented. Plans must be perfect, or the whole Blood Shadow group could crumble. The instructors keep talking about making the kids even better at what they do. Some might not make it, but the tough ones will. Pio will watches as his opponent falls. The instructors walk up to him and ask if he won. He nods, unsure. Suddenly one of them puts a sword right by his throat. It's so fast that Pio Wool can't believe it. Fear fills his eyes as he stares at the instructor. He wonders if he did something wrong. Then the instructor lowers the sword and tells him that a true assassin leaves no signs. Breaking someone's arm shows off skills, but it's dangerous. Pio Wool gasps for air after the instructor goes away. He's terrified. Six years fly by. Training goes on. The instructors look for hidden kids, finding all except one, Pio. The instructors doubt the info they have. The last kid comes out and Pio, who's been hiding nearby, finally appears. He takes a break and sits with So Yul's group. Geoxin greets him, wearing a new face. So Yul talks about the food getting better, a sign they'll be admitted soon. Pio's eyes show determination. In his room, the first sword rests. Lim Sayol thinks about the other assassins. Only 30 out of 300 are left. Jiang Hu, where they live, is about survival. It's a place of kill or be killed where you do whatever you can to stay alive. Lim found himself standing before the other two instructors, his mask removed. Confusion crossed their faces as they questioned his action. With a calm voice, Lim suggested they shed their masks too, unravelling their hidden identities. Together they huddled and spoke about their shared predicament, trapped, just like the children. 
the conversation shifted to the children, who were destined for an assassination mission. The trio understood that their only path to freedom was through this dark mission. They exchanged thoughts on the kids' progress, impressed that some surpassed even their own abilities, yet a cloud of regret lingered. Wasting such talent after one use seemed like an unfortunate end. Amidst the grim discussion, Lim introduced a book onto the table. It marked the beginning of the final stage of training. With a purposeful return, they went back to Jangu, the camp leader, and the instructors explained the last task. Three books lay before them, a test of skill. Out of thirty children, only three would master the martial art techniques within. The rest would take on the role of assassins, aiming to eliminate those who had acquired the knowledge. Silence blanketed the camp as shock rippled through the children. The instructor's proposal seemed absurd, their sanity questioned. The first sword broke the quietude, asserting that this marked the end of their training's enforcement. Post this task, they'd be left to their own devices until they departed. As thoughts swirled in the minds of the children, they debated the odds. Were the three stronger, or the twenty-seven? P.O. Wool, confident in the technique's potential, raised his hand to be the first to learn. Yet caution emerged from you will, urging him against such a rash decision. Trouble would surely follow if he volunteered. And so, the hunt of the twenty-seven began. Two out of three who mastered the martial arts fell victim to their pursuers. Guilt gnawed at the remaining assassins, their choiceless fate weighing heavily. Amidst the turmoil, the elusive P.O. Wool emerged. He had vanished for days, last seen honing his sword skills with Soyuel Jackson. In a desperate attempt, Jackson proposed a drastic solution, killing the instructors instead of P.O., but caution held them back. The instructors wouldn't allow the children free reign. Restrictions would remain, a reminder of their limitations. Deciding to focus solely on P.O. Wool, they moved ahead. P.O. sneaked up behind them, thinking that the instructors might chase them. To avoid any mistakes, P.O. decided to find out what the instructors were really up to. P.O. approached the instructors' heavily guarded base quietly, his mind racing. He used a clever mix of the turtle breathing technique and the thunder splitting cultivation technique. This let him stay hidden while moving, unlike the usual method where you could only hide while staying still. He got past the guards smoothly and entered the base. P.O. went deep into the base, searching with lots of questions in his mind. Finally, he found a scroll. Excited yet puzzled, he opened it. Inside was a shocking request, an assassination mission targeting someone named Wu Gunsing. The mission spanned seven years, with a huge reward of 500,000 gold yang. But there was a catch. No traces of the Bloodshadow group should be left behind. Pio wondered who Wu Gunsang was, that the group would spend seven years training assassins to kill him. This made Pio really angry. Just as Pio was getting more curious about this strange mission, he heard footsteps approaching. It was the first sword, the leader. The first sword burst into the room, catching Pio off guard. Pio tried to hide everything and leave no evidence, but the first sword sensed someone had been there. The first sword told the second and third swords that someone had broken in, and he ordered them to find the intruder. The second and third swords condemned the act, realising that only someone as skilled as Pio could have pulled off such an infiltration. Pio, still hidden, listened carefully as they discussed what to do. They worried that punishing Pio without evidence might lead to the children rebelling, so they decided to pin the blame on Pio. The first sword says that he will use the Hell Flute. The other two swords are shocked. They say that it is kept as the last resort, but they might have to use it sooner or later. They want to show dominance over all the children and prove who their real owner is. The first sword, Lim, takes off his mask and gets ready. He uses the flute. From up high, he looks down at the crowd. At the same time, all the children are looking for Pio, while the swords discuss where he might be. The hell flute starts playing, and as the tune fills the air, they all feel like they're in agony. It's as if some kind of insect is eating away at their bodies. Just then, Peel Wolf arrives and mentions that the instructors have activated the restriction they mentioned before. All the children are on the ground, trying to endure the pain after hearing the hell flute. CH 13. The sound of the flute is causing only slight discomfort for him, while everyone else is in terrible pain. He sits beside Lee Min and tries a dangerous technique that infuses internal energy. He thinks it might work for her since she knows the thunder-splitting cultivation technique. Even though her internal energy isn't disturbed, she's still affected by the flute's sound. Pio Wool wonders why he and the others are experiencing the effects differently. Could it be because of the snake poison he's resistant to? He also thinks about the possibility of curse poison being mixed in their food and water, triggering their pain through the flute's tune. 
The guards of the instructors arrive, but Pure Wool decides to stay, pretending he's suffering from the flute's sound just like the others. The first sword's sharp eyes caught a glint of pure wool among the children. Swiftly he drew his sword and thrust it towards the shoulder of the unsuspecting boy. The impact rendered the boy unconscious. Taking the opportunity, the first sword turned to Pio and demanded to know what he had seen in his room. Pio explained that until now he had managed to hide his extraordinary abilities, but his remarkable talent couldn't stay suppressed forever. Pio emphasised that someone as problematic as himself should be put out of the picture, suggesting that Pio was better off dead. But the second sword intervened, reminding them that Pio's skills were crucial for their assassination mission. His exceptional infiltration techniques were unmatched, making him an asset. The two swords exchanged sharp words, their disagreement evident. In the end, they decided against killing Pio immediately, opting instead to manipulate him in the future using a hell flute. It was clear that Pio's resistance was futile against the cursed poison. The antidote was administered to everyone. The first sword provided an explanation for the ordeal they had just experienced. Pio had infiltrated their hideout, causing the suffering they had endured. They emphasised that repeating such an action would lead to further agony. Meanwhile, Pio was in deep meditation, and it dawned on him that snake venom could counteract the cursed poison. In an isolated corner of their world, the other children searched for Pio, surprised by his choice to isolate himself for training. However, this seclusion was understandable as he was shunned by everyone. Pressing on, the group of children continued their journey. Unexpectedly, Pio appeared behind them, his presence carefully concealed. Yule confronted Pio, explaining that they were gathered to discuss the restriction. She deduced that he possessed an immunity to this restriction, raising questions about his true nature and abilities. Lin was convinced that someone had helped ease her pain during the restriction. She thought it might be Po, and he admitted he knew about the binding restriction. He added that sharing this information wouldn't benefit him. Jackson called everyone his comrade, but Pio Wool disagreed due to recent conflicts. Then, they all made an oath to consider Pio Wool a comrade, and pledged not to betray him. Pio Wool finally revealed that it was the curse poison, a dangerous toxin. The poison stayed dormant, but reacted to the hell flute's sound waves, attacking the body. Luckily, Pio Wool was immune, so they needed to find a way to remove it. Everyone left except Lee Min, who confided her real name, Lee Saw Min, to Pio Wool, hoping he'd remember. A faded day arrived, and the first sword announced their departure from the cave. Yu Old was tasked with leading the children outside. As the instructors left in baskets, joy spread among the kids. They were finally free from the grasp of the instructors, Pio Wool asked about the curse poison, and so Yule explained that some were cured, thanks to Lee Min Suleiman's knowledge. The final step was leaving. The bucket descended, and they all climbed on board, reminiscing about their seven years of hardship. Approaching the exit, Pio Wool tore his sleeve and blindfolded himself. He instructed everyone to do the same to prevent blindness from the intense light. After a painful struggle, they emerged into the bright world outside. Captain Gu Ju Yang of the Blood Shadow Group met with them, swiftly ordering his men to usher everyone into carriages destined for Clear Wind Manor. Their lives were to be reshaped to match the ways of the outside world. Even with his blindfold, Pio memorised the captain's voice. The carriages journeyed through mountainous terrain, finally arriving at their destination. Every person was warned. Any lapse in vigilance would cost them their life, following the captain's command. Rooms were allocated for each person, three to a space. Outside, Pio Wool finally took the chance to cleanse himself, relishing a moment that had been denied for so long. The sense of relaxation and enjoyment filled the air, but the instructors swiftly reminded them of their purpose, providing weapons that shattered their newfound peace. Amidst the serenity of Clear Breeze District's Great Moon Palace, Ju Yang and Lim shared tea. Ju Yang expressed gratitude for Lim's dedication and sacrifices toward the mission's goal. With assigned tasks complete, Lim's retirement was approved, along with the other two swords. A pang of regret swept over Lim, believing these gifted children deserved more than just a disposable mission. Ju Yang countered that destiny had already been written. Discussion shifted to the mission's sponsor. Do's knowledge was limited, deeming it unwise to provoke a benefactor who paid generously. The goal was clear, elevate the Blood Shadow group to the level of the notorious Hundred Rate Union. Among the children, preparations for the mission buzzed, Pio Wool confessed his trembling anticipation. The latter desired to unleash pent-up frustration by taking lives. An order summoned them, clutching weapons for a secretive movement. Led by the fourth sword, 
they manoeuvred through the forest until halted at a cliff's edge. Their objective unfolded, scale a mountain, infiltrate a structure mirroring their current residence, and strike a building within the Moon Palace. Fueled by fury and determination, they yearned to reclaim the site reminiscent of their agonising underground prison. In a tranquil garden, young Seol Ran walked alone. The elderly master of brilliance approached. The leader questioned Seol's solitude, provoking a standoffish response. Seol's life was intertwined with the ongoing matter, causing her discomfort. The leader's anger flared at Seol's apparent arrogance, recounting the numerous favours she'd granted. Despite this, Seol dared to seek exemption, an act that further stoked the leader's ire. She tries to soothe her nerves and says that it's a student's duty to follow their master. The leader adds that if they don't get an answer today, their plan, seven years in the making, will be put into action. She acts this way due to stress. Suddenly, another woman named Zhonghua arrives with news from King Xing. They've received the proposal they wanted, and the fate of the amazed sect rests on the young Seol's performance. She assures the leader she'll do well, but all they can offer is pitying looks. Zhonghua asks how they should handle the assassination plan. The leader is unsure. On the side, a man named Pio rests, but he feels something's wrong. An enemy spear hits one of Pio's fellow assassins. Pio looks on in shock. An assassin hidden underground is forcibly brought up by an enemy named Yuginok. It's clear the assassins are under attack. Yuginok orders his soldiers to find and defeat the invading enemies from the King Ching sect. The assassins realise they're at a disadvantage and decide to retreat. As the King Ching soldiers search for them, the assassins escape and regroup. The King Ching soldiers are furious and chase after them. Suddenly, Yu Jinok hurls a spear, killing an airborne assassin. He takes down three more with his projectiles. The only one left is Pio Wool. Yu Jinok goes up against Pio Wool, but Pio Wool kicks the spear away just in time. He then kicks it back towards the enemies. As everyone watches, Pio Wool launches an attack, killing each soldier one by one. Yu Jinok narrowly avoids a spear grazing his face. Pio Wool knows the situation is dire, so he decides to retreat. Yujinok tries to follow, but he notices an injured assassin. Despite the assassin's plea for mercy, Yujinok kills him, stating that the group had invaded the Qingxing sect. Pyo Wool kept running, thoughts swirling in his mind like leaves caught in a gust. He figured someone had given away their secrets to the enemy. The fourth sword and his henchmen had vanished before the ambush. It seemed likely they aimed to wipe out all evidence. The assassins were cut down and suddenly a barrage of arrows rained toward P.O. Wool. Some struck his chest, but still questions haunted his thoughts. He pondered if the Bloodshadow group had abandoned them, deciding to survive alone. The army spotted him, prompting a leap into the river for escape. Once on the shore, he found instructions etched into rocks, stained with blood. He realised this wasn't a simple trap. Many clans were involved in the hunt, not just the Bloodshadow group. Then, Li Min launched an attack on P.O. Wool, he barely held on, relieved to see her alive. Li Min, however, was weakened, collapsing due to serious injuries. Pio Wool questioned her about the other assassins, learning most were dead. Soya Wool and Song Tianwu's fate remained uncertain as they scattered. Li Min and a few others tried saving their own, leading to their downfall. Pio Wool gently laid Li Min down, helpless in the face of her impending death. She asked him to stay by her side till the end. As she lay there, Li Min found solace in not facing death alone. She wished for justice to prevail, wondering who was behind their plight. And as the world darkened around them, she mused that destiny had led them to this point. Their struggles had united them, and now it seemed fate had intertwined their fates with death. The question of who orchestrated this torment echoed in her fading thoughts. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps. Back at the opulent palace, our focus shifts to a seasoned leader of the assassins. Deep in the midst of a pivotal moment, the captain is engrossed in reading a message when the fourth sword, a trusted member of the group, approaches him with dire news. The assassin's escape seems to have been compromised. As the captain processes the message, he can't help but express his disappointment, realizing that all the time and effort invested in these assassins might be in vain. The message unequivocally states that their mission is now void. Concerned about the safety of the palace, the fourth sword queries the captain about potential danger. In response, the captain maintains a semblance of calm, suggesting that their hidden location should remain secure for the time being. He contemplates the best course of action, deciding to wait until the proverbial storm blows over. However, the fourth sword is insistent and curious about the identity of the requester behind the failed mission. The captain acknowledges his ability to uncover the requester's identity, 
but emphasizes the importance of maintaining discretion. The captain remains relatively unperturbed by the situation, as he appreciates the courtesy extended to them in the form of a message. However, his composure shatters when the fourth sword suddenly seizes another message and realizes that it's been laced with tracking incense. In an instant, the peace within the palace shatters as it comes under attack. The first sword attempts to warn the attackers, urging them to reconsider their assault, but they obstinately refuse to back down. Realizing the gravity of the situation, the fourth sword urges the captain to retreat. However, the captain defiantly states that he cannot flee, as the assailants are specifically after him. The captain's determination intensifies, and he asserts that the attackers have crossed a line. Preparing to defend himself and his comrades, the captain rushes into the fray, warning the assailants that they will meet their end if they persist. He calls upon all available forces to brace themselves for the impending battle. As the battle rages on in the distance, the captain's focus is abruptly diverted by a mysterious voice. Someone warns him that they won't have the opportunity to triumph. An attack is unleashed upon him, but the captain manages to mount a defense. The sheer power behind the assault leaves him in awe he inquires about the identity of his assailant. The woman approaching him takes offense at the captain's ignorance and introduces herself as the life-ending toxic heart, Zhong Guo. Before the captain can inquire whether she is the elusive requester, she curtly silences him. The captain's realization dawns late as he connects the dots and understands that the requester hails from the Yimei sect. Regret gnaws at him for not delving deeper into the requester's identity. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. Who is your favorite assassin in Manhua? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now back to the recap. Despite the looming threat, the captain refuses to succumb to despair. Zhong Hua, vexed by the captain's unwavering determination, launches another attack, which the captain skillfully fends off. Their battle escalates, and Zhong Hua marvels at the captain's martial prowess. She's relieved that they are fighting in broad daylight, negating any advantage he might have gained from the cover of night. Recognizing the need to eliminate the captain and the entire Blood Shadow group, Zhong Hua channels her power into one final, devastating attack. The captain, unable to defend against this onslaught, believes that his end is imminent. Fearing the demise of his cherished Blood Shadow group, things looked grim. Summoning every ounce of determination, the captain launches another counterattack against Zhong Hua. Just when he thinks the battle is reaching its climax, a third party unexpectedly joins the fray. The captain realizes that he's in dire straits, unable to withstand this combined assault. His strength wanes, and he falls, defeated, leaving the assassins to cry out for their fallen captain. As the dust settles, Zhong Hua turns her attention to her master, Zhong Hua's master, and greets her with an air of victory and accomplishment. Zhong Hua's master stands triumphantly over the defeated the captain, unfazed by his accusations and cries of betrayal. She feigns confusion, as if she had no knowledge of the events that led to this confrontation. Zhong Hua's master calmly orders her group to eliminate the remaining assassins. First to fall is the first sword, who, even in his last moments, questions the identity of the woman responsible for his demise. She introduces herself as Yong Xiolran, and downplays the rumors of her exceptional talents, claiming they are exaggerated. With his final breath, the First Sword reflects on the irony that decades of assassination experience proved insufficient against a disciple of the Eme sect. Yong reports to her sister that the First Sword has been eliminated. Meanwhile, the Fourth Sword is brought before Zhang Hua's master, who inquires about the number of assassins he led to the mountain. The Fourth Sword remains reticent and questions why she wants to know. Frustrated by his silence, Zhong Hua's master resorts to torture, repeating her question. The Fourth Sword persists in his refusal to reveal any information, citing loyalty. Zhong Hua's master finds his tenacity amusing and continues to inflict pain. Eventually, the Fourth Sword relents, disclosing that he led 28 assassins to the mountain. Zhong Hua's master, satisfied with the information, probes further, inquiring about the number of assassins eliminated. The woman confirms that 24 have been taken out. Zhong Hua's master swiftly orders the elimination of the remaining four, emphasizing the urgency due to the palace being engulfed in flames. Turning her attention to Yong, Zhong Hua's master explains that her role has become even more crucial. She plans to send someone to the King Chong sect to set a date for an upcoming event. She instructs Yong to prepare herself both mentally and physically for it. Zhong Hua's master insists that all these actions are undertaken in the name of the sect's fate. Meanwhile, back on the mountain, we find Pio Wol covertly spying on the monks. Recognizing the tight security at the entrance, he devises a plan to infiltrate from within. Pio Wol contemplates becoming a natural enemy of the Zhang Hu, willing to go to great lengths to achieve his objectives. Inside the monks' base, one of them prepares to venture out to collect herbs, unaware of the impending danger and espionage that surrounds them. As the monk wanders alone through the restless forest, 
His friend's warnings echo in his mind. Suddenly, he's ambushed and caught in a headlock by Pio Wool. Gasping for breath, the monk attempts to inquire about Pio Wool's identity, but Pio Wool brandishes his sword menacingly, inflicting a wound on the monk. Pio Wool leaves him in pain and confusion, wondering who could commit such an act on this sacred mountain. With a temporary cessation of violence, Pio Wool releases the monk from his grip and proceeds to interrogate him further. Pio Wool inquires about the monk's name, to which he responds, Dojin. Dojin reveals that he is a third-generation disciple of the Ching Chung sect. Pio Wool then presses him about a prominent figure named Wu Gunsong, the lone star of Ching Chung. Dojin describes Wu Gunsong as the greatest prospect that the Ching Chung sect has ever seen, mastering many of their martial arts and receiving teachings from former sect masters. Understanding the significance of this information, Pio Wool contemplates the implications of the sect's interest in Wu Gunsong. Dojin pleads for his life, having shared all he knows, but as he turns to look at Pio Wool again, he is shocked to see Pio Wool undergoing a transformation. Fear grips Dojin as he witnesses this inexplicable change, unable to comprehend what Pio Wool is planning. Back at the monk's base, the guards at the entrance are surprised to see Dojin's swift return. He explains that he forgot something and proceeds through the entrance. However, everything seems strangely different to him for Pio Wool has morphed into Dojin's appearance. Pio Wool, now assuming Dojin's identity, navigates the base and searches for Wu Gunsong's residence with remarkable ease. Inside the Ching Chung sect palace, a meeting is in session. The sect leader queries whether the situation outside has settled down. His second in command, Jin Pyong, reports that the tracking of the assassins is nearing its conclusion. The sect leader expresses his astonishment that mere assassins would dare to attack their esteemed sect as the tension within the Ching Chung sect continues to escalate, Jin Pyong acknowledges that someone must have plotted this attack on their sect, and the sect leader inquires if he knows who might be behind it. However, Jin Pyong admits that they lack concrete information, but has dispatched some disciples to gather intelligence. The sect's greatest warrior interjects, expressing his outrage at the audacious act and his determination to prevent any recurrence. Jin Pyong reassures him that they have measures in place to address the situation. The sect leader seizes the opportunity to remind everyone of the historical context, referring to the War of Heaven and Demons. During a dire moment when the Jango sect faced the threat of being overrun by the Celestial Demon Union, the extraordinary martial artist Li Guac formed the Providence Alliance. The sects that joined this alliance, such as the Shaolan Temple, the Wudan sect, and the Mount Hua sect, achieved remarkable feats and reclaimed their former glory. On the other hand, those that did not participate, including the Ching Chung sect, and the M.A. sect only earned a hollow reputation as part of the great family of Sichuan without any significant accomplishments. The sect leader emphasizes that if they aspire to catch up with the others, they cannot hold back and must remain focused. Jin Pyong reinforces the notion that they need not worry, assuring that their plans will propel them forward within a few years. The sect's greatest warrior is pleased with this outlook and inquires about Jin Pyong's son, Wu Gunsang, who has remained secluded from the outside world dedicated to intense training and thoughts of atonement. Jin Pyong expresses regret for not being able to raise his son properly, but the sect's greatest warrior dismisses his concerns, understanding that Wu Gunsang's seclusion is not unusual for someone of his age. He commends Wu Gunsang's innate talent and suggests that with proper guidance, he can rival the successors of the three great sects. The sect leader then brings up another matter, mentioning that he heard Jin Pyong has accepted a marriage proposal from the Ime sect for Wu Gunsang. Jin Pyong confirms this, explaining that the bride is the youngest disciple of the Ime sect leader, known for possessing both duty and intelligence. However, he expresses some reservations because of Ime sect leader's ambition to catch up to the Ching Chung sect. Jin Pyong reveals that he had previously rejected the proposal due to these concerns, but the sect's greatest warrior comforts him acknowledging that they have little choice but to proceed with the marriage arrangement. As the sect leader and his council continue their discussion about the Emai sect, they recognize the impracticality of remaining adversaries in such a confined territory. Given Wu Gunsong's importance to the Ching Chung sect, they acknowledge that a more diplomatic approach is necessary. Meanwhile, Pio Wool remains outside Wu Gunsong's residence, where the layout mirrors the underground cave he's familiar with. The front gate is locked, 
but P.O. Wool is determined to find a way in. He climbs onto the roof, but his presence is discovered as he overhears two monks approaching. The monks express their displeasure, believing that Wu Gunsang is using isolation training as an excuse to spend time alone with women. One of them even speculates whether one of their disciples is with Wu Gunsang. Pio Wool is shocked by this revelation, finding it inconceivable that women would be allowed into the sect let alone the Sorb training hall. After the monks depart, Pio Wool reflects on the idea that people can be different on the inside, regardless of their external appearances. As night falls, Pio Wool prepares to make his move. He runs along the building and forcibly enters, but Wu Gunseng is nowhere to be found. Undeterred, Pio Wool decides to crawl through a vent, hoping it will lead him to Wu Gunseng in another room. Inside one room, he finds swords lying around and under the vent, he sees a man with a woman. It's Wu Gunsang himself. Through the vent, P.O. Wool senses that Wu Gunsang is on a whole other level compared to the captain, the Blood Shadow Group captain. Despite his awe, P.O. Wool believes that Wu Gunsang is still human and attempts to strike him on the death pressure point. Carefully, P.O. Wool lowers a rope from the vent and tries to place it around Wu Gunsang. But as he wraps the rope around him, Wu Gunsang wakes up, realizing he must act swiftly. P.O. Wool yanks the rope, hoping to strangle Wu Gunsang. However, Wu Gunsong uses his extraordinary strength to slice the rope with his hand, freeing himself. Now face to face with Pio Wol, Wu Gunsong demands to know who he is. Pio Wol answers with his drawn blades and rushes at Wu Gunsong. To Pio Wol's surprise, Wu Gunsong remains unfazed, blocking Pio Wol's attack with just two fingers. Pio Wol is taken aback by the sheer strength and skill of his opponent. Wu Gunsong counterattacks with incredible force, overwhelming Pio Wol. The relentless assault continues and Pio Wool struggles to defend himself. He's amazed at how someone can display such power barehanded, realizing that he's running out of time to escape the dire situation. Pio Wool attempts another blade attack, only to have it blocked once more by Wu Gunsong's two fingers. Wu Gunsong takes a moment to acknowledge Pio Wool's skills, and then demands to know who sent him. Pio Wool, exhausted and breathless, is unable to respond. Wu Gunsong bursts into laughter and suggests that Pio Wool was sent by the girl's father to avenge her death. Pio Wool, however, remains clueless about the girl and her father's involvement as he grapples with the overwhelming presence of Wu Gunsang. The story briefly delves into Wu Gunsang's life. Despite his natural talent for martial arts, Wu Gunsang found little joy in it. His interest waned as he became more fascinated with women. However, one fateful night, he encountered a woman who became his biggest mistake. Following a drunken encounter with her, she took her own life. As a form of punishment, Wu Gunsang was forced into a year of isolation training. Now, Pio Wol and Wu Gunsang face off, with Pio Wol having spent most of his life training to kill Wu Gunsang. However, Wu Gunsang believes that Pio Wol was sent by the girl's father to avenge her death. Pio Wol, overwhelmed by Wu Gunsang's immense power, can only focus on the terrifying energy emanating from his opponent. As Wu Gunsang rushes at Pio Wol, the two engage in a fierce battle. Pio Wol expends significant energy to block Wu Gunsong's relentless attacks. Pio Wol manages to sneak in a kick, irritating Wu Gunsong further. Wu Gunsong retaliates, sending Pio Wol to the ground, hoping to deliver the final blow. However, Pio Wol evades the attack and rushes to retrieve a blade. He hurls the blade at Wu Gunsong, but Wu Gunsong blocks every move Pio Wol makes. Wu Gunsong then unveils the Ching Chong sex secret technique the 72 sword waves. Realizing the dire situation he's in, Pio Wol grabs the woman who was with Wu Gunsang to shield himself. This move annoys Wu Gunsang, prompting him to attempt a strike with his sword. While under attack, Pio Wol recalls his earlier conversation with Yo about whether he was the escapee or the wolf. This memory serves as motivation for Pio Wol to fight back. Surprising Wu Gunsang, Pio Wol defends against the Ching Cheng sect's secret martial art technique. He had studied it exhaustively in order to survive, and is confident in his ability to dismantle it. Using the swift mind technique, Pio Wol maneuvers around Wu Gunsang and spots a window. Seizing his chance, Pio Wol thrusts his sword right through Wu Gunsang's chest, leaving Wu Gunsang in disbelief. Having accomplished his objective and avenged the Blood Shadow group, panic and unrest grip the sect. Meanwhile, inside Wu Gunsang's residence, Jin Pyong is devastated and bewildered by how such an event could occur. The sect's greatest warrior realizes something and urgently tells the sect leader that they need to dispose of the girl involved in this incident. The leader of the sect finds himself grappling with the ethical implications of his proposed course of action, disposing of a disciple within the sect. The dilemma arises as the sect's greatest warrior, aware of the potential fallout, asserts that Wu Gunsang's reputation would plummet if it were to be revealed that he was involved with a girl during isolation training. This, in turn, 
would tarnish the sect's reputation as well. This idea deeply troubles the sect leader. The sect's greatest warrior, noticing the leader's distress, acknowledges the irreversible nature of the situation. He argues that since Wu Gun Song is a part of their sect, their collective reputation would collapse if no action is taken. He further speculates that there may be someone who hired the assassin, someone who stands to gain from Wu Gun Song's downfall, particularly within the rival Ching Chung sect. The sect's greatest warrior emphasizes that they must not allow their sect's reputation to be tarnished under any circumstances. As the sect leader contemplates how to respond, they are interrupted by their fellow sect members. These members vehemently oppose the idea of sacrificing a human life, even if it means protecting the sect's reputation, asserting that a human life should always be prioritized. The sect's greatest warrior, concerned about the sect's future, brings up the fact that their rivals, the Shaolin and Wu Dong sects, will only widen the gap if they don't take action. He fears that their sect might eventually become insignificant. As they ponder these words, Jin Pyong, a disciple, rises with his son's sword in hand and approaches the disciple in question. He chastises her for not helping Wu Gunsong and expresses his disappointment. The frightened disciple pleads for her life, but it's too late. The sect leader rushes to Jin Pyong and demands an explanation for his actions. Jin Pyong justifies his actions by saying, that Wu Gunsong represented not only the hope of the Ching Chung sect, but everything they stood for. He couldn't stand idly by and watch their reputation crumble. Jin Pyong is willing to accept any punishment for his actions. Meanwhile, the Ime sect leader receives a shocking message about the assassination of Wu Gunsong. She is furious that all the assassins weren't apprehended as planned, and her ambitions to rule the Ching Chung sect have been jeopardized by an unnecessary scheme gone wrong. Zhang Guo suggests that they need to find and eliminate the responsible assassin, as they might possess crucial information. A Mei sect leader reveals that the Ching Chung sect has already sought their assistance and urges Zhang Guo to gather the others. She instructs them to set up an inescapable net immediately. Turning to Yong, she cynically remarks that Yong must be delighted now that the wedding is cancelled. Yong retorts, clarifying that she is far from happy. She has just lost her husband. Unsure if she's being mocked, Ran exits the room along with the disciples. In a tranquil rural area, we observe a farmer leisurely strolling down a dirt road. The farmer, named, inquires about the commotion when he encounters two men who are actively searching for a criminal responsible for a grave sin. They demand that identify himself, and he promptly responds that he is a resident of a nearby village, and he is on his way back home after a day's work on his farm. The men are curious about how he could finish his farming duties so early and he explains that he completed his weed-cutting task ahead of schedule. Satisfied with the farmer's response, the men decide to allow him to pass. However, as he continues walking, one of the men becomes suspicious and questions how he can still be so clean after farming, especially if he had been cutting weeds with a sickle. The farmer becomes visibly nervous, and the men accuse him of being the assassin responsible for Wu Gunsang's death, as described by Emei. They urgently fire off a signal and call for backup. The man's suspicions prove correct, as the farmer reveals his true identity and vigorously fights back. The farmer locks eyes with the man and unveils a new weapon, attempting to choke the man while demanding to know more about the Emei sect leader. The man, struggling for breath, admits that the Emei sect leader is indeed the Emei sect leader. Ha ha, Pio Wol, the farmer's true name, asks if the Emei sect leader gave a direct order for the man's actions. The man confirms that the Emei sect leader ordered all disciples of the Emei sect to assist the Ching Chung sect in capturing the assassin, no matter the cost. Pyo Wol is perplexed, wondering if the Emei sect has always been so cooperative with the Ching Chung sect. The man privately thinks that his backup should arrive soon. Pyo Wol begins piecing together the puzzle. He deduces that the assassin must be someone who is familiar with Wu Gun Song and is of lower status, someone willing to invest seven years of time and considerable wealth into this elaborate plan. Pio Wol concludes that the Ime sect leader must be the one behind it all. Just as the backup arrives, the man thinks he is about to be rescued and taunts Pio Wol, claiming that his time is up. However, Pio Wol has had enough, and he swiftly overpowers and dispatches all of them. Back at the Emoi sect headquarters, it is reported that the assassin has broken through the martial artist encircling net and managed to escape. Zhong Hua is frustrated by this development, Realizing that the assassin is growing stronger, she resolves to pursue him with all their forces. However, Yong intervenes and disagrees, suggesting a different approach. She asserts that they won't be able to capture him by chasing him blindly. Zhang Hua inquires about Yong's alternative plan, and Yong elaborates. She points out that the fact that the assassin hasn't been caught with an inescapable net 
implies that he possesses skills beyond their expectations. If they continue pursuing him in this manner, they will only see the back of his head. Zhongguo asks for a better idea, and Yong proposes that they need to predict the assassin's next move. Yong has a hunch about the assassin's possible destination. He must be exhausted, so it's likely he will return to the place he considers safest, the place where he was raised as an assassin for a very long time. She explains that they've identified the location where the Blood Shadow group raised assassins, which is somewhere around Bang. Although annoyed by Yong's intelligence, Jung-Wa confirms that the area received frequent supplies. They quickly decide to head to Bang and try to beat the assassin there, knowing that Pio Wu is injured, and they believe he won't be able to keep going for long. As they close in on Pio Wu, he runs up a wall, thinking he can evade them. However, he's perplexed by how they seem to predict his movements. When he locks eyes with Yong, he realizes she is the mastermind behind this plan. Meanwhile, both sects stumble upon an entrance that leads underground, strongly suspecting that this is where Pio Wu went. The Ching Chung sect's greatest warrior emphasizes the importance of capturing the assassin alive. Zhong Hua, on the other hand, instructs her disciples to do the same, but she desires Pio Wu's death. Both sects make their way underground and are shocked to discover that this is where the Blood Shadow group raised their assassins. To the Ching Chung sect's greatest warrior's astonishment, he spots an exact replica of the Ching Chung sect within the underground complex. Zhong Hua and her disciples notice the building as well, causing anxiety to creep in. A disciple from the Ching Chung sect also observes the replica and becomes enraged, insisting they cannot let this go unnoticed. The Ching Chung sect's greatest warrior believes that Wu Gun Song's assassination must have been planned for a long time, and maintaining such a facility without assistance seems impossible. He suspects there must have been someone protecting the Blood Shadow group. Zhong Hua watches the unfolding events in stunned silence. The Ching Chong sect's greatest warrior breaks into laughter and informs his disciples that capturing the assassin is their top priority at the moment. The Ching Chong sect's greatest warrior reiterates the importance of capturing the assassin alive to his disciples, making sure they understand his terms before embarking on their journey. Zhong Hua approaches the warrior and expresses her willingness to command her own disciples to do the same. The warrior emphasizes that they can do whatever they want to the assassin, but he must be captured alive. Zhong Hua nervously accepts his request and walks away. As she departs, the warrior reflects on the potential consequences of the assassin's death, emphasizing that it would deeply upset him. He senses that someone has underestimated their sect and plans to hunt down the perpetrators even if they belong to one of the five great sects. Zhong Hua reassures him that there's nothing to worry about, even though they aren't facing each other directly. However, Zhong Hua is acutely aware of the warrior's suspicions about the Imei sect, and she sweats nervously, knowing that she must locate the assassin before the Ching Chung sect, regardless of the circumstances. Meanwhile, Yong explores the cave, and immediately senses danger upon entering. She recognizes that everyone is eager to capture the assassin, this underground environment is his home. She understands that both sects are out of their element in this unfamiliar territory. The Ching Chung sect's greatest warrior discovers the face of the real building's base, and as he navigates the massive facility, he doubts that the assassins could have constructed it by themselves. He struggles to piece together who might have assisted them in building such a complex. Upon reaching the last room, he begins searching for clues. His hand brushes against the wall, revealing a secret pressure plate that unveils a hole in the wall containing a golden tube. Inside the tube, he finds a message detailing the request to assassinate Wu Gunsang. Enraged, he can't believe someone would destroy the Ching Chung sect's future for a mere 500,000 yong. Noticing an even larger hole in the wall, he enters and finds a book on a table. However, this room is far from ordinary. It's a pit filled with thousands of snakes. Undeterred, he approaches the table and examines the book which bears the mark of the Demon School. He realizes that the Nine Demon School is the clan that disappeared long ago during the War of Heaven and Demons. As he contemplates this revelation, the search for Pio Wool continues. The Ching Chung sect's disciples find grains of rice on the floor, indicating that Pio Wool is nearby. They caution each other not to let their guard down, fully aware that the assassin could strike at any moment. As they walk away together, one of the disciples falls behind, and Pio Wool seizes the opportunity to launch an attack. As Pio Wool's attack goes unnoticed by the other disciples, they struggle to believe that the assassin has been living underground. One disciple suggests that the assassin must have cheated in his battle with Wun Gun Sang, believing that there's no way Wun could have lost a fair fight. Pio Wool takes offense to this and swiftly deals with the skeptical disciple. The remaining disciples finally notice their fallen comrade 
and begin to scatter in fear, providing Pio Wool with the advantage to eliminate them one by one. One disciple remains, and despite his fear, he challenges the assassin to reveal himself. Pio Wool decides to have a bit of fun and extinguishes the torches, plunging the area into darkness. In the other group of disciples, King Ming, a Ching Cheng sect disciple, reflects on Pio Wool's tactics. He speculates that if Pio Wool's sole purpose was to escape, he would have done whatever it took to outrun his pursuers and hide. Instead, P.O. Wool has led them into an environment he knows best, suggesting that he intends to fight until the end in his familiar underground domain. Ming sees an opportunity to capture the assassin and boost his reputation within the sect. He starts giving orders to the other disciples, urging them to move in pairs and, above all, to remain vigilant. However, as Ming takes his next step, he unknowingly triggers a pressure plate setting off a barrage of arrows. He warns the others to watch out, but some disciples are injured in the process. Ming looks up and sees another round of arrows coming their way. He can't believe that anyone could live in a cave with such intricate traps. Meanwhile, the Ching Chung sect's greatest warrior continues examining the pit, filled with thousands of snakes. He speculates that these snakes might have been collected for research by the Nine Demon School. The warrior wonders if this cave was originally the base of the Nine Demon School. On the other side, the other disciples are in a state of panic, fearing that P.O. Wool might attack at any moment. Zheng Hua steps up to display her leadership and tries to calm them down, yelling at them to stop panicking. She reassures them that the assassin won't make any rash moves due to his injuries. Zheng Hua emphasizes the importance of not scattering, but staying together. However, P.O. Wool senses the urgency of his situation and decides to make a move. Zheng Hua, with her instincts on high alert, senses that something is amiss. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Spontaneous Weirdo, 5928, who commented, Damn bro, that was fast on our betrayed Isekai video. Thanks for commenting. As P.O. Wool inches closer, jung -Wa swiftly turns to defend herself, engaging in a head-to-head -head confrontation with him. In the heat of the battle, jung -Wa manages to grab hold of P.O. Wool's hand, but he attempts to retaliate with his free hand, aiming for jung -Wa's eye and sending two fingers through it. Zhong Gua screams in agony, but Pio Wol's attack ends there. Pio Wol, caught off guard by Yong, now has her sword running through his side. It becomes evident to Yong that Pio Wol has great senses, as her attack landed perfectly. Yong offers Pio Wol a chance to surrender, but Pio Wol responds with laughter, clearly having other plans in mind. He tries to launch an attack on Yong, but she anticipates it. Pio Wol gets up and pulls a sword out of his side, then glances back at Yong, asking if she would spare him if he surrenders. Yong hesitates, and Pio Wool realizes she won't spare him. He points out that she wouldn't have killed the rest of the Bloodshadow group if she were inclined to show mercy. Yong then questions Pio Wool about how much he knows. Pio Wool reveals that he knows that Ron, the Otis of Nine Calamities, is connected to everything. Fearing the leakage of information, Zhang Hua demands that Yong kill Pio Wool immediately. Yong takes a moment to contemplate, stating that while she is not fond of her master either, she must avenge her fiancé, Wun Gun Sang. Pio Wool understands that facing Yong head-on is suicide, but before he can attempt to retreat, he is hit by a powerful energy blast. Zhang Hua recognizes the gravity of the situation and attempts to finish Pio Wool herself, but the Ching Chung sect's greatest warrior intervenes, instructing her to step aside. Zhang Hua tries to protect the EMC sect one last time, insisting that the assassin must be killed before he can use any sorcery. The greatest warrior, however, is not concerned about that. He crouches down to talk to P.O. Wool and asks him why he did it, stating that even an assassin should possess the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. P.O. Wool reveals to the greatest warrior that he was kidnapped and brought to the cave when he was just 14 years old. He didn't have the luxury of distinguishing between right and wrong. P.O. Wool explains that, as someone raised to be an assassin, he didn't have a choice. The greatest warrior notices P.O. Wool's lack of empathy in his eyes, which are filled with malice. He senses that Pio Wool could have been a valuable asset if he had been raised differently. The greatest warrior then produces the tube and shows Pio Wool the request to kill one Gunseng. He asks Pio Wool who the requester is, and Pio Wool admits that he has an idea. The greatest warrior poses a question to Pio Wool, asking if he had stopped them from killing him because he too is contemplating the same person. As the greatest warrior looks back, Zhong Hua is overcome with nausea. The Ching Chung sect's disciples arrive, concerned for their master and asking if he needs assistance. The Ching Chung sect's greatest warrior inquires about what happened to the others, and Ming informs him that they didn't make it because they fell into the assassin's trap. Upset by this news, the warrior knows what he must do next. He gets up and approaches P.O. Wool, expressing that a quick death is too extravagant for him. He seizes P.O. Wool by the foot 
and begins dragging him with the intention of making P.O. Wool experience excruciating pain as a form of atonement for the lives he's taken. P.O. Wool contemplates who will compensate him for the seven years he lost during his captivity. The greatest warrior has brought P.O. Wool all the way to the base of the real ones. And with P.O. Wool's foot in hand, he stares down at the pit of snakes. The greatest warrior offers P.O. Wool one last chance to show remorse. But all P.O. Wool can do is laugh. The greatest warrior is resolute in his decision and believes that P.O. Wool has no right to continue living in this world. He throws P.O. Wool down into the pit of snakes, condemning him to a painful death while seeking redemption for his sins. The greatest warrior then turns to the others and announces their exit from the cave emphasizing the need to seal the entrance to ensure that this place is never used again. Left alone in the snake pit, P.O. Wool faces the relentless onslaught of the snakes, which waste no time in biting him. Surprisingly, P.O. Wool begins to hiss back at the snakes and grabs hold of one, displaying dominance over them. Over the years spent underground, P.O. Wool adapts to his environment, learning martial art techniques from the books left on the dead bodies of his captors. His body undergoes significant changes due to his unique snake-based diet, resulting in lighter skin and hair. Completely transformed, P.O. Wool awaits his opportunity to seek revenge above ground. In a different scene, some guy and his companions are brought to a brothel where they witness a man being thrown out of the top floor. P.O. Wool, who has emerged from the cave, is responsible for this act. P.O. Wool insists on being left alone for three days, which clearly upsets the brothel's boss, who is baffled by the stranger's sudden appearance and actions. Amid the commotion in the brothel, one of the guards attempts to threaten P.O. Wool for throwing a martial artist from the Sapphire House out of the window. However, P.O. Wool remains unbothered and swiftly incapacitates both guards with his soul-reaping thread. The woman in charge is intimidated by P.O. Wool's skill, realizing that he is no ordinary man. She dogents not recall encountering such a master in Sichuan. P.O. Wool's mere flick of the wrist leaves a lasting impression, and the boss quickly asks for P.O. Wool's forgiveness. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.